Afternoon all. Um, well, yeah, so a uh, little bit about m me and Know Now Information. Um, so my name's Chris Cooper. Um, I set up Know Now two years ago with David Patterson. We're both ex-IBM in the smart cities area. And Know Now is a smart city innovation company. And one of the things that we do is around big data. So let me tell you a story, because this is what we're here for, to, to hear stories. Um, so last year, I was invited by Mark Braggins. Raise your arm, Mark. You're here in the room. And um, Mark was running Blue Light Camp. And he said, come along. You'll really enjoy yourself. This was my first hackathon. I really didn't know what I was getting myself in for. And what was interesting about Blue Light Camp, which brings together the Blue Light Services community, um, so this is both the uh, policy makers and the responders across all of the Blue Light Services. And what was really interesting is that these guys in the first day, because we had uh, a starting session where we looked at all the problems of the world, and they were really deep and interesting, and I'm a kind of a social scientist, and I understood deeply what was going on. I'm also an, uh, an engineer as well, and the next day we had the, the data guys coming in, and we were just hacking data left, right, and center. And what really struck me was that what the policy people wanted that was going to save money and improve lives was not what the data guys were working on. Uh, but, hell, we came up with some really cool data. Anyhow, that's not, that's not important. Um, so then two weeks after that, um, I was invited uh, by the STFC to a big data um, announcement, and they just released all of this data, and it was uh, fantastic. And then a light bulb moment came on, um, and I thought, well, why don't we apply to the competition that this big data came about? So we came up with something called Whether You Do, Whether You Don't, and there's a play on the weathers. And the reason for this is that... Um, not, th not that we got our picture taken, and there's, there's a picture of uh, Mark on the right, the man with the arm. Uh, myself, uh, my fellow uh, at the back, Dave Patterson, and on the left, uh, a chap from IBM and, and, uh, and a guy from uh, STFC. Um, but the, the, the fundamental reason why we did it is that where we come from in Hampshire, um, 2014, that winter saw us incredibly wet. Um, stuff that happened in my lifetime of 40 odd years of living there, I'd never seen. Uh, and we, yeah, we do get some weather down there. It's a very green county. But let me just give you some figures. Uh, the overtime bill for Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service was a million pounds over three months. Um, two people sadly lost their lives. Um, a number of businesses have still not reopened. There are people still not living in their homes 18 months after the flood of flooding occurred in some of the areas of Hampshire. The economic cost can be measured in billions, but we don't measure that effectively. Um, but the, the, the stunning thing that we just need to look at is that even in our fire and rescue service area, a lot of incidents occurred. And this was the number of the problem, is that actually there is a lot of activity going on, but it's all reactive. And the idea of whether you do, whether you don't, was to say, well, let's look at this differently by surely, if you knew if there was weather about to occur that was going to cause a flood and you knew where the flooding was already or where the saturation of the water was already in, on your land, couldn't you be proactive in your response rather than reactive? Because proactive saves money than reactive. And this is the story that we're about to see. Did we get to prove that that's what you could do? So whether you do or whether you don't, or as we now call it, the flood event model. Um, but it all starts with open data. So we saw one of the open data providers was Hampshire Fire and Rescue Service, and they were brilliant. Um, but each individual one of these guys that participated in giving us some open data has also got an open data story and open data challenge. Um, so a quick straw poll. Who thinks the data is good enough? Anyone from raise their hands? <laughs> oh, you've heard this before, haven't you? <laughs> no, the data's absolutely rubbish. Uh, what do I mean by that? Let's take the fire and rescue service data. Um, when they book, an, a, book a, a rescue, um, it just happens to be where the guy's standing. Uh, that could be back at the station. It could be where the incident occurred. It could be somewhere on the vague stretch of road. It could be just where they happen to be. Um, that's not really good and accurate. Um, when you're looking at um, flood or environment agency data on the current state of the rivers, 
Uh, well, they only measure stuff that they want to, not the stuff where the water is. Oh, well, that's a slight problem. Um, and the other thing is that some of the data that we want, especially from the Met Office, that would be really, really cool, um, that, that ain't free. And part of the rules of the competition was that we had to use free open data. Uh, by the way, I'm not an advocate of the word open equals free, by the way. Um, I think you have open data that is well managed, owned, and, and you can believe in it. And, and there's free data which you probably shouldn't touch with the barge pole. Uh, so <laughs> the other key thing that we had was this catalyst called the Hampshire Hub. I'd encourage you to go to it. Um, if you want to know more about how it occurred, go and talk to Mar Mark, that's the man with the arm, um, because Mark was the uh, leader of the Hampshire Hub where he brought together all those different data partners. And we also, but what it created for us was a community that we could actually sit around a table and go, is this data set good enough? What does this tell us? How can I use this data set to go and do something? So it's a very human experience. This isn't a dry data experience. This is about people understanding and passionately committing their data to a cause. But they've also got to understand what their data means. So check out Hampshire Hub. It's very cool. Um, but this is a flood event. So what we're not trying to do is predict where flooding occurs, because the Environment Agency kind of do an OK job about that already. What we're doing is saying, look, you know that flooding is going to occur. Um, some areas that you get flooded, you really don't care about. It's a field. Yeah, the farmer might care, the cow might care, but you as an individual citizen really don't care. What you care about is your journey to work, where you live, your, your relatives, your family, your friends, um, your assets. And so this is about saying, okay, what is important things to consider? So we looked at flood events that are hitting roads because it generated an information stub around a rescue or where something was occurring. Um, this also has a really important business benefit as well, because what we're trying to do is to say, look, if you can um, identify before something is going to happen that it's going to happen. Yes, this sounds like minority report. I know. I haven't nicked it. I'm just copying it, okay? Um, so if you could predict where something's going to happen and better allocate your resources, and that resources could be um, a flood defence around, around a substation. It could be closing off a road and making sure that uh, Google Maps, Waze, the AA knew about it very timely in advance so you could drive, rerouting, etc. Or it could be putting in some sandbags in front of, um, for a community to then go and dish out, but time before. Because often what was occurring is that floods would occur, the resilience teams would go into action, and it was always catch up, catch up, catch up. We're talking about being proactive. Giving yourself that day, two days of additional notice. And then the key thing is, is do you have the policies to be able to do something with it? So this is where we were focusing. Um, and uh, we're using these guys' data to drive this is what you could do. Um, we also, so now let's look at um, some of the data that we use. So I'm going to give you a quick tour in the interest of time. If you'd like to know more about the data sets, the visualization, how we did it, the data analysts, come and see me afterwards. More than happy to talk about it. Um, we used a number of partners, and our big partner here is the STFC up at Hartree Center, so a big shout out to them, and a big thank you as well. Um, we're using an IBM Big Insights Class supercomputer, so yes, you do need a lot of computing power to do this. Um, and we also had uh, the ODI grant as well, which we, which we won the competition. So um, you need a chunk of money to get it all to go. Um, so let's talk about the data. So what did we do? Um, we broke Hampshire up into 50 meter grid squares. So we took the SU grid reference. Um, so for those that aren't from the UK, uh, Ordnance Survey, who provide all the mapping, have uh, um, split up the UK into grid areas. SU happens to nicely cover most of Hampshire. Uh, why Hampshire? Because we've got the Hampshire Hub data, which is all local open data for Hampshire. Plus I live there, so I'm kind of selfish. Um, so the other idea was to then say, okay, we've got these 50 meter grid squares. We now need to overlay all this data and normalize. Now, um, it took us six weeks to normalize the data out of a 12 week project program. And this is because not all the data comes in 50 meter grid squares. So we had a lot of arguments as to, well, is my data on this edge of the boundary or on that edge of the boundary? Um, if you want to know those stories, um, please don't ask me. Too many scares. Um, but we are now starting to build up an overlay of different layers of information, but a 50 meter grid square. So if you can imagine the geology of Hampshire is a one in 500, now we're going down to one in 50. So we're having to create lots of data and drive that normalization and making sure the boundaries are right. 
things that we found out, especially on geology, it's very clayey. So we actually had to take geology and some of the geology data out because it's driving too many false positives. Because it was saying, of course you're gonna have a flood event here. So you've got chalk and clay coming together. It's bad news. Um, we also had to look at surface water. Of course you've got flooding because it's a river there. Uh, and again, you kind of got to be removing some of the data as well. You also need to recognize that in certain areas, just because there's watery, because of its uh, topology, there isn't necessarily going to be much going on. And you've also got the existing flood extents area as well. What this is all building up to is then saying, okay, I now have an understanding of where stuff occurs. The other important bit is where is my infrastructure that I want to protect? So now we have the road rail interactions. So now we can starting to see, oh, hold on, I've now got, where have I got um, assets that are on a gradient that's now going to start to be flooding and I can start driving, where am I going to have some areas of focus? We're starting to get interesting now. Our first pass of the predictive model is starting to generate, whoa, we can see that we've got areas of focus that we need to go in. So all we now need to look at is where's the events occurred that where we've got this stuff happening. And there it is. So where you have the green splodges, these are where events we predicted in the model would occur. So you're going, hold on, how can you predict a model on stuff that's already happened in the past? OK, I'll admit, this is a predicted model based on historical data. So what we have proven is that we built the model through 99 to 2006, and then we tested the model from 2006 to 2014. We now know with 85% accuracy that we can predict where a flood event will occur due to the pending flood water about to happen as a result of the weather about to hit us. And I think that's pretty cool. Because when we talk to the resilience community, they can now go, ooh, we can now use that and start preparing and being proactive. So where are we going next? This is a really good news story of how open data can be used and applied for in a practical, pragmatic, useful outcomes, business-centric led outcome. So we're working with Resilience Direct, who are the local resilience community, led with OS's help, um, and to bring in uh, an automated data feed so you'll be able to plug into your visualization if you're a resilience officer for a local authority and go, yikes, I'm about to get some flooding. I need to do something. That's brilliant. We're collaborating with Network Rail to see if we can improve predictive warning of uh, flood events that are occurring or hitting their rail infrastructure. So this is about stopping uh, overhead lines crashing into the railway. Um, and we're working with a large multinational to take flood event model, but looking at brush fires in California. Um, so this is using the same magic source, a very large computer, and driving that normalization, because that's a great story. Um, whatever we do, because we're using open data, and this is a public project, so our source is understood and it's known and be published, um, but what we're looking is working with partners. If you have another place that would like to have a flood event model, please give us a shout. Um, and also, if you're, we're looking at um, creating a time machine. Because um, one of the things that we've created by default is, because it's based on historical data, is that we can now go, well, based on this particular day, did I have flooding in this particular place? And we can give you a statistical view as to whether that was likely to occur. So we're just in the process now of testing that so we don't trip ourselves up. We're hoping to run the model on a periodic basis through this winter to see if it's still 85% accurate. So we get a fresh update in the spring as to how good or bad we were as well. And um, the other final piece is, is that, um, yeah, if we, if we can find a, another, another a local authority to not just do Hampshire that's got a different geological makeup, that would also be another challenge. But of course, all that needs some spondulix, which um, I'm, I'm hoping the audience has, has plenty of. So <laughs> that was the story of Flood Event Model. Um, I've been Chris Cooper. Um, if you want to know some more, um, give us a shout. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from you again. So thank you very much. Cheers. Goodbye.